Amen. Thank you, brother. All right, so we left off last week. We got into uh, Romans 10, 8 is where we left off, and I took you back to Deuteronomy chapter 30 and showed you how Paul was making, once again, a practical application of the Scripture that was back there in, in Deuteronomy, and we're going to see that many times. We'll pull out a few <clears throat> other instances where he does that. Um, so we want to make sure that we make correct application of Scripture. <clears throat> I think you've had that beat to death in you by now. You should understand the three applications. It's important to understand that because it'll keep you from getting off into the weeds and some things and, and some heresies. You might apply something doctrinally uh, incorrectly to the wrong group, and it'll cause heresies to uh, come of that. So we look over here in Romans 10.9, very familiar passage, and uh, this is salvation right here. Uh, if you've ever used the Romans road to try to lead somebody to Christ, you no doubt have taken them to Romans 10.9 before you take them to Romans 10.13. Okay, so they, there's some essential things we want to look at in the passage. He said that, the, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. All right, so I want to look at the verse, and, and well, let's read verse 10. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with, mouth, with the mouth... Uh, confession is made unto salvation. So what a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Right? So if, when you confess something, that means you're trusting it. You're putting your faith and confidence. If you're confessing it, it's coming out of the heart. Okay, with the heart, man believeth unto righteousness. So if, if you don't believe something, it's not going to come out of your heart. It's not going to come out of your mouth. Right? You're going to kind of, well, I, I, you know, when you ask somebody on the street, you say, well, if you die today, where would you go? They usually give you some kind of, well, I hope I'll go to heaven. That's not a very strong confession. And it gives you a good indicator and probably you need to dig a little bit further and to find out whether that person's actually ever even heard the gospel. Christ died for our sins. He's buried. He rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Okay, that's the gospel, the grace of God. And so there's some essential parts that you need to understand or that they need to understand if you're not saved, but if you're dealing with people, that Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven. Okay? Why? Because he paid the price, right? That atonement. And you'll hear all kind of wacky stuff come out of people's mouths because it's, the gospel nowadays has been watered down to where we want to make it more appealing to people. We want to re relate to people. No, Christ died for our sins. That makes us what? Makes us sinners. Right? I asked one time, I was teaching some, some youth, and I said, uh, um, how many of you are saved? And I said, okay, how'd you get saved? Well, by committing my life to Christ. That's not it, folks. Committing yourself to Christ does not save you. Discipleship and salvation are two different things. I said, well, okay, a Catholic priest has committed his life to Christ. Is he saved? No, they're not. The problem is that they try to add something to salvation. Committing your life to Christ. You, listen, I gave my heart. Listen, I understand all the people are well-meaning when they say that, but you're not understanding the central issue. It is the payment for sin. It is that atonement. Christ is the only way to heaven. You can't add anything to it. If you're committing yourself... What are you doing? You're trusting your own righteousness. And there's so many people out there that are fooled by that kind of lingo because they've been to some youth camp, some contemporary bunch of nonsense, and they get the, the contemporary music going, and they come, oh, well, everybody floods the altar and so on and so forth, and they're crying, and I've seen these things. Listen, you get all these things, and they get these numbers up. They get the numbers up, and they say, oh, yeah, all these kids got saved. Are you sure? Did they get the clear presentation of the gospel? Do they understand that they're a sinner on their way to hell? I don't know about you, but that's how the Holy Spirit dealt with me. Okay, he came down and dealt with me and said, Jesus Christ is the only way. He said, look and live. <clears throat> right? As a serpent lifted up on the pole. You've got to look at Jesus Christ. He's it. He is the atonement. He paid the price for sins. Jesus Christ died for your sins. Personal. All right? You can get people to assent to a fact. What Roman Catholic does not believe that Jesus Christ died for sins? All of them do. It's in their creed, in the Nicene Creed. You can believe the so-called fundamentals, but if you don't apply that thing personally to you, then you never receive the atonement. You just assent it to a fact in the head. It's getting quiet. It gets real quiet. See, when you've got, you got to start making that thing personal. He said, your lamb. Exodus chapter 12, it's got to be personal. I knew that I, personally me, was going to hell. Who convicted me of that? Was it the preacher? No, it was the word of God through the Holy Spirit of God and said, 
you're dying, you're lost, you're on your way to hell. And I said, Lord God, save me. Did I know everything theologically that was involved with that? Absolutely not. I was a babe. I didn't know anything. But I knew that I was going to hell. And I knew I deserved it. Like that thief on the cross, I deserved it. He didn't. Okay? So it's got to be personal. Jesus Christ died for your sins. Trusting Christ alone for salvation. Not the sacraments, not baptism, not anything else. Once again, here's the illustration. <clears throat> That's the blood. What am I resting on? What am I trusting? The blood. If it wasn't for this, where would I go? The law of sin and death says I would go down. But because I'm trusting that, that's the blood, that's how I get to heaven. Amen. Nothing else. Amen. Nothing but the blood, right? Amen. So, <clears throat> trusting Christ alone for salvation. And then lastly, believing the resurrection is necessary for what? Justification. If Christ didn't die, we'd be dead in vain. Look at 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. You say, man, you're pretty adamant about that. Yes, I'm pretty adamant because I've heard a lot of things said that people just don't exactly understand what exactly Christ did for them personally. So they're trusting something else other than the finished work of Christ. Look at 1 Corinthians 15, 17. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is in vain. You're yet in your sins. <clears throat> you can have faith in something, but if it's not based on a fact, it's, it's not worth anything. So if it wasn't a fact that Jesus Christ was resurrected, he would not be, de be declared to be the Son of God. Look at Romans 1.3. Romans 1.3. It says this, and, de and declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. If Christ did not raise, be ra if he was not raised again, he would not have been God in the flesh. He ascended on his own righteousness because he's God in the flesh. All right, look at Romans 4.25. Who was delivered for our offenses. He, Christ died for our sins and was raised again for our justification. And what does that justification mean? Just as if you never sinned. Right, let's go to, let's go to it again. Let's go to Acts 13. Acts 13.39. Acts 13, 39. And by him some, and by him the elect, and by him all that believe are justified from some things. All things. From which ye could not be justified by the law of Moses. Couldn't justify murder and adultery, could it? What was the penalty for that? to be stoned, to be burnt in some cases, right? So you're justified from all things. What did Paul say he was before he got saved? He was a murderer. He was injurious. He took pleasure in the things he in seeing other people be put into prison and be put to death. But he was justified from all things by what? Believing on Christ. All right? So justification, if he was not... If he was not who he said he was, if it wasn't a fact, he would not have been raised from the dead. Can you go find Muhammad's tomb? Yeah, you can find Buddha. You can find some of these men down through the years who've started these different religions. Can you find Joseph Smith? If you're trusting in Joseph Smith, then you got, need your head checked out. <clears throat> Amen? Amen? Some of these cults that have started because why? They drew, they drew away disciples after themselves because they wanted to steal God's glory. They wanted to be the ones... Well, Jesus Christ is not going to share his glory with another. Amen. Amen. All right, so we understand. This is salvation. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart, God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Now, this is an important point. Acts 8, Ethiopian eunuch. What was being preached to the Ethiopian eunuch? Isaiah 53. What's in the, what, what is in Isaiah 53? The blood atonement. For justification, right? Now, notice what he says. Now, this is after he's, he's saying to you, how can I accept some man guide me? Look, look at uh, 835. 
Acts 8.35, Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. Jesus is the only way. Right? He said, what you're reading in Isaiah 53, that's Jesus Christ. All right? And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? So, you're seeing a transition here, aren't we? All right, he's thinking, I need to be baptized. Yes, you do, but there's something that needs to take place before that. And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. Notice where it comes from. And he answered, I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He confessed him, didn't he? All right, by grace through faith. All right? He said, uh, and Philip, now, here's the important part. If you have any other Bible, okay, if you have an NIV, an ESV, I think the New King James didn't take this out. That's the one that didn't. But uh, any other new Bibles, they all have this verse taken out. I'm not going to get you to raise your hand because somebody might burn you at the stake or something if you, don't, if you don't have a King James in here. But if you do have another version of the Bible, I, just, I would say go check it out because I can guarantee this verse is not in there. It's been taken out of every new, ver every new version. You should ask yourself, why is that? Well, because somebody believed in baptismal regeneration who took that out. You think that's an important verse? That matches Romans 10, 9, doesn't it? And this man's a Gentile, isn't he? he and Paul's the apostle to the who? To the Gentiles, all right? And he, can, he commanded the chariot to stand still. They went down both into the water, no sprinkling, Right? They went down into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. You see the fruit of salvation there? See that thing that accompanied? He rejoiced. He rejoiced that he had been forgiven. He had been justified from all things. He's a eunuch. He's, a, he's an Ethiopian. All right, he was a proselyte to Judaism, but listen, man, they were still on the outside looking in. But guess what? That servant of servants, because that's where he, came, he comes from, from Ham, right? He was cursed. Cursed be Canaan, right? He gets to get in. And the first one saved by grace through faith was an Ethiopian eunuch by the finished work of Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay. So you see how that matches up with, with how you get saved now in the church age. All right. So let's continue on. Let's go back to Romans chapter 10, verse 11. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Now he's quoting once again. He's quoting that from Isaiah. I uh, was at 28, I think it was, 28, 16. He's quoting that verse again. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto, rich unto how many? All that call upon him. That's Jew and Gentile both. Right? So we've got to look at distinctions. Divisions in the Bible. There's three divisions. First of the Jew as a people. Gentile, and then the church. What's the church made up of? Jew and Gentile. It's made up of both. Now your racial distinction as far as spiritually speaking goes away once you get into the church. But ethnically speaking, you still have these two groups, don't we? Okay? So the Jew... Comes from who? Shem. Gentile comes from who? Japheth and Ham. Three sons of Noah. Okay? Shem, go, Shem goes into Asia. <clears throat> Japheth, he goes into Europe. This is Genesis chapter 10. If you want to find the table of the nations and Ham, it's called the land of Ham, goes into Africa. That's your three divisions. But the Tower of Babel, their languages were confounded, correct? What happened in the book of Acts chapter 2? What miracle took place in Acts 2? They could all hear each other. He was bringing them all back in together into Christ. 
All right, there's neither Jew nor Gentile, but in the church, but right now you still have this distinction. And when you get over into the tribulation, God begins dealing with nations again, doesn't he? You got the Jew and you got the Gentile. Okay, we'll get into that word willing later. Okay? So there's neither Jew nor Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. Notice this, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. All right? Does anybody know where that verse shows up the first time in your Bible? Let's look at it. Go back to Joel. Notice once again, Paul's taking something from the tribulation or the Old Testament that applies doctrine to that Jew, and he's applying it to the church. Look at Joel chapter 2. But look, look what Paul leaves out. Joel 2, 32. <clears throat> and it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. So salvation is a deliverance. What are you delivered from? From the wrath to come. Right? What are these Jews here going to be delivered from? From the Antichrist. All right? For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord hath said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. You see the tribulation context? That's, that's, that's dealing with the tribulation doctrinally, historically, back over here in the book of Joel. It's back way back when about Nebuchadnezzar, actually after that. So, or before that, actually Joel's before that. But you can see that you've got to rightly divide the word. So what Paul's doing, he's taking that thing from Joel 2, and he's practically applying it to you and me. That's how we get in. Call upon the name of the Lord, right? But over here, it's going to take place again. It'll be applied once again to that Jew Notice it says Mount Zion. That's Jerusalem over there. Okay? That's the apple of his eye. All right, let's go back to Romans 10, 13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. All right, there's a, there's a movement out there, I guess. It's a, they say, well, they'll get into this whole thing about prayer. You know, if you pray to be saved, well, that's a work. You couldn't be saved because prayer is a work. Who's ever heard that? That's, that's from a lot of Bible-believing circles. You just start nitpicking through the things and saying, well, you know, his, you, you, you had a prayer, and that, it's not a prayer, it's so and so forth, and they'll start trying to, you know, uh, pick that dung out of pepper. Okay? Splitting hairs. Once again, it's, it's what are you trusting to keep you out of hell? Whether you prayed it, whether you screened it from the top of your mouth, out of the street, if you believe it, it's going to come out of your mouth because it comes from the heart. So what that does is it, what you're doing is you're, people get discouraged a lot of times because, well, maybe their numbers aren't up. and Well, they couldn't be really saved if they were living like X, Y, and Z. So let's, let's try to add some little thing to it. So, well, if you pray to be, if you pray to be saved, then you, could, you couldn't really be saved because that's a work. It says not of works lest any man should boast, right? You see how that convoluted that gets into? And what you get is a bunch of retreads. You get a bunch of people who, well, maybe I didn't, maybe I didn't say it right. I don't know. Maybe I didn't pray. Well, I prayed, so I guess I'm not saved. And you get some people confused, don't you? Is there any assurance in that? That's why you got to keep it simple. What are you trusting in? What are you trusting to keep you out of hell? Okay, look at. I think it's Luke 18. Let's look at it here. Yeah, here it is. Luke 18, 10. Two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the, one a, and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed, Thus within himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican standing afar off would not even lift, not even so much as lift his eyes to heaven, unto heaven, but smote his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a what? Sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house, what? Justified, rather than the other. For everyone that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. God giveth grace to the humble, but resisteth the proud. What was the Pharisee's problem? Even though he prayed... 
It was self. It was pride, wasn't it? He lifted himself up. Did he put himself in the place of the publican? Did he say, I'm a sinner. I deserve death. I deserve hell. Okay? So some, somebody might say, well, they said the sinner's prayer, they're not saved. Listen, man, if you believe from the heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins and that he was buried and he rose again the third day, you're, going, you're saved. If you trusted that, if you trusted any other thing, if you trust in your good works like the Pharisee, I don't care how much you pray. Now let's look at the flip side of that. Let's look, let's look at Acts chapter 10. Look how God opens up this door to this Gentile. Acts chapter 10 is Cornelius. There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion, verse 1, of the band called the Italian band, a devout man. That's not a music band, by the way. It's a hundred men that he's in charge of. A devout man and one that feared God with all his house, which gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. Was he saved? No. But is he doing good works? Is he walking with the light that he has? Absolutely. He saw in a vision evidently about the ninth hour of the day an angel, an angel of God coming into him and saying unto him, Cornelius. And when he looked on him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? And he said unto him, Thy prayers and thine alms are come up for a memorial before God. All right? So he's doing good things, is he not? All right, let's go to, hold your place in Acts 10. Go back to Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2. Look at Romans um, 2, look at 5. But after thy hardness and impenitent heart, treasure up unto thyself wrath against the day of, uh, uh, day of wrath and revelation, revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to every man according to his deeds. To them who by patient continuance and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life. That's Cornelius. Was he doing good things? Absolutely. But unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation, and wrath. See the flip side? If a person wants the light, God will give them the light. They're doing good things. God will get that man a missionary. God will find a way to reach that person wherever they're at. I don't care if it's the deepest, darkest jungle in Africa. God will find a way to get that person the light. Okay? Amen? But those that are contentious and want to argue with the truth, God ain't going to deal with them. He's, okay, fine. He leaves them to their own devices. He gives them up to a reprobate mind as in Romans 1.20. Or not 1.20, but chapter 1. Okay? But he's rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, we're back in Romans 10, shall be saved. Okay? So when Cornelius got saved, how did he get saved? At the preaching of Peter. Okay? I had you, held, I had you hold your place. Go back to Acts 10. We'll show you. Look at Peter's preaching. Look, uh, for sake of time, look at 1039. Acts 1039. And, when we, and we are witnesses of all things which he did both in the land of, Jew, of the Jews and in Jerusalem whom they slew and hanged on a tree. There's the crucifixion. Him God raised up the third day and showed him openly. There's right, right there. He, there's the crucifixion. Not to all people all the people, but unto witnesses chosen before God, even to us who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. So he's not, he's not just a spirit. He's got flesh and bone, doesn't he? And he commanded us to preach unto the people to testify that it is he which was ordained of God to be the judge of quick and dead. To him give all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. Notice this. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word heard the word. So then faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Notice the Holy Spirit stops Peter before he can say, repent, be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Acts 2.38. Notice he stops him right there. He says, boom, and he puts, and he gives them the Holy Ghost, those Gentile dogs right in front of a bunch of unbelieving Jews and they begin speaking in tongues. Why? Because that was a sign to Israel. Notice how the Holy Spirit does that. That's important. So how did, they get, how did they get saved? They wanted to hear what Peter had to preach. God shows the foolishness of preaching to save them which, which believe. Amen? How would you get saved? Through preaching. 
whether it was in your room by yourself like me, the preaching of the, of the Word of God, whether you watched on the Internet, whether you came down to the aisle, it's what do you trust in? Don't let somebody try to talk you out of your salvation. Remember those simple illustrations I try to do for you? Lean on this thing. What are you leaning on? The blood of Jesus Christ. That's it. It's the only thing that's going to get us to heaven because that's the payment for sin. That's what God required at Calvary. All right? Let's go back to uh, Romans 10, uh, verse 14. How then, sh how then shall they call on him in whom they, have not, in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of, of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. All right, so everybody in here is called to preach. Man or woman. That doesn't mean you're ordained to preach from official office in the church, but you, preaching is just confessing the truth. It's preaching the truth. About what? Christ died for your sins. That he was buried, he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. When you witness to somebody, you're preaching to that person. Amen? He said, go ye in all the world and preach. Did he, did, was he just talking to me or was he talking to Brother Barry or some of these other preachers? No. Because you're going to go to places that you're, at your work that we can't go to. And the biggest thing that preaches is your life. Your testimony. What do, you, what do people think of you so what they're, they're going to have an opinion one way or the other. Amen? So when you're preaching, you're preaching the truth. You, anybody can witness, and you're called to witness. Amen? So let's look back at the verse, though. <clears throat> how shall they call on him in whom they have not heard or believed? And how shall they believe on him in him in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Now, he's, he's going back over here. How shall they uh, preach except they be sent? That's what apostle means. Apostolos. That's what that means, a sent one. All of us have a ministry of reconciliation. He's given all of us the ministry of reconciliation. God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses. Right? He's given us the ability to go out and use our mouth for the glory of God. That's every single one of us, right? All right, but you have sent ones. All of us are sent into the world. You're not an apostle. You don't have the signs of the apostle. But all of us have the ability to preach. Don't let somebody tell you that you shouldn't be preaching. I'm talking about at the workplace, where you're at with your family. Okay? When, the, when it comes to this office here, that's a different office. But we're talking about every single person sent out there into the world to preach the gospel to, those that, to, to, to the lost uh, people in the world. But let's look at the verse once again. Go back to Isaiah 52. <clears throat> Once again, he's taking something from the Old Testament, using it for the church. In this age, Isaiah 52. Verse 7. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publisheth peace, that bringeth good tidings of good good that publish salvation, that saith unto Zion, thy God reigneth. All right, so gospel, it simply just means good tidings. That's what it means, okay? But notice what he's talking about here, how beautiful are the mount, or upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings. Well, who's he talking? <laughs> this, we're going to get in some, some prophecy here. Let's look back over here at Song of Solomon. Look at Song of Solomon real quick. We'll give you the doctrinal prophetic application here. Look at Song of Solomon 2.8. The voice of my, be my beloved, behold, he cometh leaping upon the mountains, skipping upon the hills. This is the one that has glad tidings, good things, good things to come. Look at uh, 2.17. Well, look at 2.16. My beloved is mine, and I am his. He feedeth among the lilies. He's the lily of the valley, isn't he? Until the day break, son, son of righteousness returns with healing in his wings in the morning, and the shadows flee away. Turn, my beloved, and be thou like a roe or a young heart upon the mountains of Beth -air. Now, which mountains are we talking about? Let's go back to Deuteronomy real quick. 
Look at Deuteronomy 33. See how tricky this can be? You can, you, you've got dual application once again. Look at Deuteronomy 33, 1. This is the song of Moses. And this is the blessing wherewith Moses, the man of God, blessed the children of Israel before his death. And he said, The Lord came from Sinai and rose up from Seir unto them and shined forth, see the morning, from the Mount Paran. And he came with ten thousands of saints from his right hand with, went a fiery law for them. What is that? Is that first advent or second advent? Like preacher said, I think it was Wednesday. Has that happened yet? No. So, what you're reading, second advent. Fiery law goes out before him. He comes down upon Mount Sinai. Is one of the places he comes to? Where'd the law come to? Mount Sinai. Exodus chapter 19, Exodus chapter 24. They saw the Lord. They saw a throne. You see that back there in the Old Testament in Exodus? He's going to come again. He's coming again. With how many? Ten thousands of his saints. Well, where do you see that quote in the New Testament? Anybody know? Jude. Somebody's been reading the Bible. Jude, that's right. And who prophesied that? Enoch. Enoch, Enoch, however you want to pronounce his name. It is verse, which one is it? Here it is, 14. <clears throat> Enoch, and Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. That's what Moses was quoting in Deuteronomy 32, something that Enoch had prophesied. Moses wrote it down, and he's talking about the second advent of Jesus Christ. And the Lord's going to bring good tidings with him when he comes back. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. That's what he preached in his first advent, correct? Right? Remember how the preacher talked, if you were here Wednesday night, he talked about how that thing could, could have went either way. There didn't have to be a church age. Had Israel accepted their Messiah? All these things in the Old Testament, they're already prophesied, they already fit in there. And he would have ap applied those things doctrinally. But since the Jew rejected him, now you'll take a verse like that and Paul applies it practically, or the Lord himself. It's tricky, isn't it? Okay, that's why it's, he said, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, what? Rightly dividing the word of truth. Amen? All right, let's continue. Let's go back to Isaiah, uh, not Isaiah, Romans 10. It says this, verse 16, But they have not all obeyed the gospel, for Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report. What's he quoting there? Isaiah 53, 1. Correct? Now watch how the Lord, watch how he applies this thing in John chapter 12. John chapter 12, look back over in verse, look at, start in verse 35. Well, look at verse 34. John 12, 34. The people answered him, We have heard out of the law that Christ abideth forever. And how sayest thou, the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is the Son of Man? Well, the Son of Man is the one that comes on the clouds in Daniel 7, 13. Then Jesus said unto, him, unto them, Yet a little while is the light with you. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness come upon you. For he that walketh in darkness knoweth not whither he goeth. While you have light, believe in the light, that ye may be the children of light. These things spake Jesus and departed and did hide himself from them. But though he had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed not on him. See that? We talked about this in Romans 9. They didn't believe. They did not believe the word. That the saying of Isaiah, the prophet, might be fulfilled, which he spake, Lord, who hath believed our report, and to whom hath the arm of the Lord been revealed? To that Jew first. And the majority of them rejected the word of God incarnate. They rejected the preaching and the hearing of the word. Therefore they could not believe because that Isaiah saith, he hath blinded their eyes and hardened their heart that they should not see with their eyes nor understand with their heart and be converted and I should heal them. 
These things said Isaiah when he, he saw his glory and spake of him. That's Isaiah chapter 6. Notice this, nevertheless among the chief rulers also many believed on him. But because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. So these Pharisees, some of these men, chief rulers in the synagogues, one of those was Nicodemus, one of those was Joseph of Arimathea. Did they eventually confess him? They sure did, right? So some of those Pharisees believed on him, but they, they loved what men thought of them over what God thought. You ever been there? Oh, I know everybody in here like to make everybody else say that they're bold as a line and all. Yeah, but there's been times you've shut your mouth when you should have opened it. Oh, yeah. Street preaching, fire believing, Bible believing. Oh, yeah. Yeah, whatever. We're all cowards at one point in time in our life. I guarantee it. That flesh is weak. Spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. So don't get too high and mighty. All right, let's go back to Romans 10. All right, but you see that, what he's, what he's saying there? Notice how the Lord is quoting Old Testament. He's, he's quoting Scripture. All these things are coming to pass, and he's quoting them. He's marking them down. He's fulfilling prophecies. All right, go back to Romans 10, verse 17. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by what? The Word of God. So you think that's important to understand and to read the Word of God? Man not, doth not live by bread alone, but by what? By every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God doth man live. Amen? All right. But I say, have they not heard? Yes, verily their sound went in all the earth and their words unto the ends of the world. All right. We're going to, we've got about three minutes. <clears throat> Let's look at, look at the context. Let's look at who's saying what here. Look at this. Uh, go back to Psalms because that's what he's quoting. Psalms 19. Psalm 19, start at verse 1. <clears throat> the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. They got, a, they got a message, don't they? That's what to preach is, is to declare something. Day unto day uttereth utter speech, night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Who's the there? Who's the subject? Day unto day, not unto night. Things that are in the heavens are declaring a message, are they not? All right, their line has gone out through all the earth. In their words to the end of the world, in them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun, which is what? As a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoiceth, as a strong man to run a race. All right? So what's he talking about there? Things in the heavens, right? As a bridegroom. He set a tabernacle for the what? Son. All right? What's that son a type of? The Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? The son of righteousness. Remember that? Malachi 4.2. Son of righteousness. Returns with healing in his wings. Notice how he's... What he does in Malachi, he, he spells it S-U-N, capital S-U-N, right? So that makes that son, that's a type of Christ. He's as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, all right? So you've got the morning, and you've got the evening. What's the son do in the morning? He comes up. All right, type of the resurrection. What's he go? What's what happens in the evening? It sets, and then he comes back. What? Comes up again. When the sun sets in the evening, what color is the sky? It's red. Right. On when the Lord was on the cross, what took place? Was one of the miracles that took place? Darkness came over all the earth. Well, as the Son of Man, the Son of God hung on the cross, darkness came. He went down. But guess what? In the morning, he's coming back up. See the new birth? See the rebirth? Every pagan religion out there believes in this. 
That's what human sacrifice was all about. They worshiped what? They worshiped the sun, the moon, and the stars. All right? For sake of time, how many t different types of rays does the sun have? Three, right? What are they? You've got a light ray, you've got a heat ray, and you've got gamma, or actinic, right? The light ray. You can see it, but you can't feel it. Right? Light ray. He said, I'm the what? Light of the world. There's Jesus Christ. You got the sun. There's witness. You got the heat ray. You can feel it. I put feet. <coughs> feel. I did it again. I, I, can, I can feel it, but cannot what? Cannot see it. All right, what's that type of? Holy Spirit. All right, and then you have a gamma ray. It's invisible. Cannot see, nor feel, but it will kill you. Right? What's that a type of? God the Father. Right? Three types of rays that is put out from the sun. Now, what's the pagan worship? They worship the sun. Why? Because they worship physical. Because where does their life come from? It comes from the earth. The earthly. Where does your life come from? The heavenlies. Son of man came down from heaven. He took on the likeness of sinful flesh, right? So we see the sun... See the type of Christ? That's why every pagan religion worships the sun. What else do they worship? The moon. What's the moon a type of? We've got a little time here. What's the moon a type of? Type of the church. She starts small, gets big, gets small again. She goes into apostasy. How many sides does the moon have to her? Two sides. Right? You got an old man, you got a new man. Where's the moon get her light from? From the sun. Which direction does the moon go? Opposite. She goes against the world. Which, which direction does the sun go? East to west, against the world. He said, they'll, if they hated me, they'll hate you. Why? Because you're against the world and he's against it. He died for it, but they won't receive him. Light is coming to the world and men love darkness rather than light. Because what? Their deeds were evil, right? So the moon, she's a, type of, she's a type of the bride. So is there a message going out through all the earth? You better believe there is. Is there enough knowledge? Is there enough light for somebody to get saved? Sure, they can, if they want the light, God will give it to them. And their proof is against themselves because they all worship the sun, the moon, and the stars. What do you think Muhammad's got up on that mosque? Got a crescent moon, doesn't he? He's worshiping the moon god. God is. That's Ashtaroth. All right? All right, just real quick, go to Song of Solomon, and I'll take you here, and then we'll, fi we'll finish. Just so you think I'm not out there in the, uh, in the weeds somewhere. Go to Song of Solomon 6.10. Who is she that looketh forth as the morning? As the morning. Where is she getting her light from? The sun. Fair as the moon, clear as the sun, and watch this. Terrible as what? An army with banners. She's coming back with the king, and she's an army with banners, and she's coming back to this earth with the son of righteousness with healing in his wings. Amen? Natural man can't receive that. Thinks that's foolishness. That's why they're chasing every other thing under the sun. Literally. Amen? Alright. Let's go ahead and stop there. <clears throat> Father, Lord God, we just uh, we thank you for this time together.
Thank you for the study of your word. Thank you for the truth you've given us, Lord, in, the, in a book that we can understand. And Father, we just pray for today's service. Pray for Brother Barry as he leads the choir. Pray for our pastor as he breaks the bread of life one more time. And Father, I just thank you for saving me. In Lord Jesus' name I pray. For Jesus' sake I ask it. Amen. Amen. All right.